Jim Leatherlips. It's an unusual name, but it's a real story and a real person. Is that right? It is. It is. He lived the long hair, and, and uh, in fact, according to my family, he would come down here many times with some of the wine dots into this spring, and he would sit on the hillside and tell stories. Was he a leader in the wine dot? He was a wine dot chief. In fact, he signed the Greenville Treaty in 1795. What do we know about the execution? Six Indians that came here to put leather lips on trial, which was a mock trial. They wanted to get rid of him. As you remember, Tecumseh was forming his coalition. And when Tecumseh was forming his coalition, his brother sometimes would meddle to Nsquadawa, the prophet. And so he decided to end Leatherlips' life and maybe they could get the, uh, the Wyandots that were under Leatherlips here to join his confederation. Well, it backfired. And after the execution, then the Wyandots actually fought against Tecumseh in the War of 1812. The Sells family was here. They were some of the original settlers of Dublin and their descendants went on to have the Sells Circus, right? Five Sells brothers were actually at the execution of Leather Lips. So between the five Sells brothers and there was an Elias Lewis from Worthington and a Peter Millington from Down River. So there was at least seven witnesses. I think if Leather Lips would have let them know that this is false, I'm not a witch doctor and I don't want to die, I think there'd been a hand-to-hand -hand combat that day. I believe the Sells boys would have broke in and I really think that Leather Lips he didn't want any interference because he knew that Tecumseh, or at least his brother, the prophet, would have brought Indians over here and tried to wipe out Sale Settlement. I will always believe that Leather Lips was more of a hero than what we give him credit to be because he stopped the Sells boys from fighting. Do we know where the name Leather Lips came from? Well, they think it came from the fact that he never told a lie. The settlers trusted him. And as Elias Lewis once said years after this execution, the hardest thing I ever did was see that good man put to death. And your great-grandfather was that custodian of the grave, and the grave has been in the family's care since then. Yes. Joseph Thompson died in 1862, but he's the one who started to protect the grave of Leather Lips. After the execution, the Indians left, and then Joseph later, he backfilled all of that with rocks. And those rocks then covered the grave of Leather Lips. And that brings us to the curse of Leather Lips. What is it and how did it start? After Leather Lips was executed and the grave was taken care of, okay, we also had a son of Joseph named Samuel. And so they formed a club in Columbus and it was called the Dot Club. It was a group of gentlemen that loved history. This membership club got so excited they voted to put the monument, which is up there now. Now this was when it was still nothing more than just a pile of rocks in the woods. They decided to clean the area up and when they did, they accidentally uncovered the remains of Leather Lips. They had to lower those remains now down to a proper depth. That's when the rumors started about the curse. Well, it's a fascinating story, and it seems like the more we learn about Leather Lips, the more there is to find out. So thanks for sharing your family story with us. So that's the history of the real-life figure named Leather Lips. According to local urban legend, his curse is the reason there always seems to be a dark cloud hanging over the memorial tournament. And by that, I mean rain. To find out how much, if any, of this is true, I met with Ben Gelber, who's examined the evidence. Well, Ben, we know you know about meteorology and the weather, but it turns out you know about leather lips too. You've studied this character. Yeah, because uh, so often questions come up, you know, is there anything to the lore of leather lips and rain in Muirfield? So I went back and investigated uh, the climate records to see if we could tie in number of rainy days uh, with tournament days. May and early June have the greatest number of rainy days. It rains uh, a little bit more than 60% of the time. So as you looked at the data before and after the 1970s when the tournament starts, what kind of change did you see? Was there any? One thing that we have looked at is the change in the amount of moisture in the air. We're clearly having more rainy days and more days with heavy rain, say compared to the 1930s through the 1960s. We've gotten progressively wetter. As the climate has warmed, the oceans have warmed, there's more available moisture in the air, conducive to showers and storms, which happens to coincide with the initiation of the tournament. So you're telling me there was actually less humidity in the good old days? For the most part, yes. And we use dew points as a measure of the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. And also the number of days with southerly breezes coming off the Gulf of Mexico, that has increased significantly in the past 25 years. So we're having even more rainy days during our rainiest time of the year traditionally. Ben, so in your opinion, yes or no, is there a curse? As a meteorologist, I do not believe there is a curse, partly because of the history doesn't quite match up. The area that he hunted 
is on the opposite side of the river from Muirfield. And secondly, yes, it's unusual to have that many rainy days and heavy rainfall days, but there's a climate signal and the time of year that all allow this to fall within the realm of natural variability. Or bad luck. Curses foiled again. Curses foiled again, <laughs> I love it.